Welcome everyone to the webinar, Why Banning Factory Farms is More Important Than Ever. We're gonna dive in and hear all about the Farm System Reform Act and the movement to ban factory farms across the country. I'm Rebecca Wolf with Food and Water Watch, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers with us tonight, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. We have an extra special video message from Senator Cory Booker at, to all attendees tonight, so be sure to stick with us through the hour of our program for that at the end. Before I get started, just a quick orientation if you're new to using Zoom. We're here on video and you'll be able to see all of the speakers as they share if you click that link in the email that you received. And don't worry, again, we can't see you. We will be keeping everyone on mute to cut down on background noise. So if you have a question at any point in the presentation, you just click that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to them as many as we can as possible, but we are going to start with the ones that you wrote in when you RSVP'd to us. So bear with us as we try to answer the most asked ones first. I'll also note that we will not be using the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. So again, just click the Q&A if you want to ask a question. If you have any technical is issues or you are joining us over the phone and have questions, you can email us at help at fwaction.org. Again, that's help at fwaction.org. We do have folks standing by to help with that. So let's get into it. Right now, our food system is reeling from the house of cards that the meat industry has created. Agribusiness giants claim that the current food system with its factory farms and extreme levels of concentration is necessary to keep everyone fed. But the coronavirus pandemic is destroying their carefully crafted narrative around this. We see major supermarkets are struggling to meet the demand for milk and meat, but not due to sh food shortages. In fact, many farmers are being forced to dump, or dump their milk or euthanize their animals. So this is actually a problem of distribution. We see now that this highly consolidated industrial food system that harms our neighbors, our farmers, our animals, and the environment is in fact less resilient than a regional diversified system. We need smaller, more diverse crop and livestock systems and regional food systems, and a new federal bill called the Farm System Reform Act is our roadmap. We're really proud of this robust legislation and are grateful for the leadership of Senator Cory Booker for introducing it in the Senate and Representative Ro Khanna for introducing it in the House of Representatives just today, actually. That's right, so it's an extra special day. Um, we're gonna speak to you about the Farm System Reform Act on the day that it was introduced in the House. So again, our, tonight our focus is the Farm System Reform Act and the stories that our speakers are going to be sharing with you. I'm ecstatic to introduce them uh, this evening to share their stories of fighting to change the food system in their states and across the country. I will just say that the women I'm about to introduce are true forces and personal heroes to many, including myself. So first tonight, we're gonna have Michelle Merkel. Michelle is my colleague and managing director of advocacy at Food and Water Watch. She oversees the work of the legal research policy and electoral teams Prior to joining Food and Water Watch, she worked as an attorney at a number of nonprofits and also served as an attorney in the enforcement division of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, where she developed and brought actions for violations of federal environmental laws. Next, we're gonna have Barb Kalbach. Barb is a fourth generation family farmer from Adair County, Iowa, and a leader with Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. She has organized across the state uh, starting during the farm crisis in the 1980s. And in 2002, she organized for her, in her community to stop a 7,000 head sew factory farm from being built and is a statewide movement leader for family farmers taking on corporate control of our food and farm system. Barb also worked in Madison County Hospital's nursing units for many years and has been a longtime advocate for universal health care in Iowa. And finally speaking tonight, we'll have Monica Brooks. She is a community leader in Salisbury, Maryland, organizing to protect Marylanders from the polluting chicken factory farm industry there. Monica co-founded the grassroots group Concerned Citizens Against Industrial CAFOs that stopped the siting 
of what would have been the largest chicken factory farm in Maryland. She is on the board of Assateague Coastal Trust, as well as Socially Responsible Agricultural Project. And she is also a pastor's wife, business owner, Spanish teacher, and mother. So following the presentations from our speakers, we will answer some of your questions that you submitted to our panelists. And then finally, after that, I wanna mention one more time after the Q&A, we're gonna play a short video message from Senator Cory Booker to all of you. Um, I can say from all of us, we're very thankful for his and Representative Ro Khanna's leadership. Um, you're gonna to wanna to stick around through the end of this lineup. Now, I've only just summarized the inspiring work that all of our speakers have done, and I wanna thank them for what they do every day, as well as for being with us here tonight. Um, with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Michelle Merkel to give us a little bit of her story there. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm honored to join everyone this evening. So we live in unprecedented times when even before COVID-19, a threat to our food, our water, our climate, things that we depend on put in question really the future of human existence on earth. And agricultural consolidation and the proliferation of factory farms are some of these threats. Livestock production has changed significantly over the past several decades. There are about 10,000 small and medium-sized farms closing each year. Many of them have been pushed out by factory farms that warehouse thousands or even millions of animals in crowded spaces. These operations produce enormous volumes of waste. They pollute the air and water, they exploit workers, they harm animal welfare, fuel antibiotic resistance and climate change and harm rural communities that they are purported to benefit. And the transition to factory farming really wasn't an accident. It was fueled by bad farm policies that led to an overproduction of cheap feed that we feed to factory farm animals. Um, there was unrestricted access to antibiotics to promote growth and to keep disease at bay in filthy overcrowded building, buildings. And it's been further enabled by federal regulators who have allowed the biggest meat companies to unfairly dominate the market. And of course we have agencies like EPA who are failing to uphold environmental laws. And so to get rid of factory farms, we really have to um, change the fundamental structure of the food system, which will require policy change. And policy change will only come from building political power to elect decision makers who are not beholden to the meat industry. In order to do this, Food and Water Watch was um, the first national group to call for a ban on new and expanding factory farms in 2018. And calling for an outright ban may seem audacious and at the time, even a lot of our allies thought it was really unrealistic. But if we've learned anything from our fight to ban fracking, which is a dangerous method of gas extraction also happening in rural communities, it's time to go big or go home. And since we were the first national organization to call for a ban on fracking, we have collectively banned fracking in four states, showing that when we come together, we can achieve bold goals. And in less than two years since we called for a ban on factory farms, we have active factory farm moratorium campaigns in multiple states, including in states with hundreds or even thousands of factory farms like Iowa, Maryland, Oregon, and there's a nascent campaign in New Mexico. And equally exciting, as Rebecca mentioned, is that in December of 2019, Senator Cory Booker introduced a groundbreaking piece of federal legislation, the Farm System Reform Act, that would ban new and expanding factory farms while also providing for a transition to a sustainable food system. At the time of introduction, there were 17 national grassroots organizations who endorsed the bill, representing environmental, public health, farmer interests. Many of these groups had input into the bill thanks to the great outreach that Senator Booker's staff did. And just today, also as Rebecca mentioned, Congressman Rokana announced the introduction of the companion bill in the House. We are so grateful for Senator Booker and Representative Rokana's leadership, for their hardworking staffs, and for their roadmap forward. And I also want to acknowledge the importance of people on the ground like Barb and Monica, who are working hard to create the political space for the Farm System Reform Act by keeping these issues in front of their elected officials. And because Barb and Monica are going to talk to you a little bit about the state-based campaigns that they helped to lead, I'm going to spend a few more minutes just providing um, some detail about the Farm System Reform Act. So like I said, it bans new and expanding large factory farms, which is fantastic. But what about the 25,000 existing facilities? while the bill also invests in a just transition away from factory farming. It would set a deadline of 2040 for the phase out of existing facilities while providing funds to help farmers transition. 
And that's super important because a handful of firms currently dominate the pro processing of livestock and poultry. They're known as integrators. Um, they control every stage of the food chain. And these integrators often contract with farmers or growers to raise livestock or poultry for them. The integrators, the big companies, retain ownership over the animals, reap most of the profits, while the contract growers, who nationally live at or below the poverty line without second farm income, are forced to absorb risks and costs and have uh, incur large amounts of debt. And so the Farm System Reform Act would give growers access to funds to help pay off that debt through a hundred billion dollar voluntary buyout program so they can farm differently by raising pasture-based livestock or growing specialty crops. This transition period also provides a very unique opportunity to rebuild local food economies, whereby farmers are selling into local markets and rural communities are reaping the benefits of retaining dollars locally. And we've seen this work before in tobacco growing regions of North Carolina, where funding and incentives help tobacco farmers transition to fruit and vegetable operations, creating a surge in locally grown produce and producing thousands of new jobs. The Farm System Reform Act would also level the playing field for contract growers by making big ag companies responsible for manure. So these operations produce enormous amounts of waste, 885 billion pounds each year. Ostensibly, this waste is put on crops as fertilizer. We have too much manure nationwide, too little land. So when it's over applied, the waste leaches into groundwater, it runs off into surface water, it pollutes our soil. And the big integrated companies have long pawned off under their contracts with the growers the enormous burden of the waste and dead animal disposal. And so the Farm System Reform Act would hold the big companies liable for their pollution and for the negative impacts on communities. The bill also levels the playing field between growers and meat packers because it strengthens a law Packers and Stockyards Act. It's a law that um, is supposed to assure fair competition and um, protect you know, consumers and livestock producers from unfair, deceptive, and discriminatory practices. And so the market reforms under the bill will help to ensure fair, ensure fair prices and wagers for growers and level the playing field, as I said, for smaller slaughterhouses and meat packers. It's important because of consolidation now, meat packers can engage in practices that distort the market, manip manipulate the price of meat in a way that gouges farmers because of the power that they have. So for example, the top four meat packing firms today slaughter 80% of beef cattle in the US, 63% of pork packing, and 53% of broiler chicken processing. This power means that since 2013, net farm income for United States farmers has fallen by more than half, and median on-farm income has been negative over the past number of years. Medium net, median net farm income for US farmers in 2020 is projected to be negative $1,840. That was an estimate made before COVID-19 pandemic disrupted the food supply chain. Yet the giant meat packers continue to post record profits. And finally, the bill restores mandatory country of origin labeling and prohibits USDA from labeling foreign imported meat products as products of the USA. Currently beef and pork products that are shipped to the United States and processed here or repackaged here can be labeled products of the USA even when the animals were raised in another country. So this has allowed multinational meat packers to pass their imported meat off as American, further eroding fair competition and preventing shoppers from supporting their local rural communities. So I'll leave you with um, one final thought. As former leaders have said, never let a serious crisis go to waste. Under normal circumstances, we might accept incremental change, but we shouldn't now. Because as you probably know, food workers have died during the pandemic and thousands of people have been sickened because of the vulnerabilities in our food system caused by the greed of big agribusinesses and their political allies. As many experts have said, even before the crisis, our highly consolidated industrial food system is in fact less resilient than the regional diversified systems it replaced. We need smaller, more diverse crop and livestock systems and regional food economies. Let's make sure that people have not died in vain and use this moment to collectively fight for the passage of the Farm System Reform Act, which would have made our food system less vulnerable during this pandemic and will make us safer as our country recovers. With that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and I think I will also mention, so Michelle covered a lot of what is in the Farm System Reform Act and a lot of the issues obviously with the current system. We're gonna be dropping a link of an interactive website um, called Farms Versus Factories in the chat that you can check out after tonight's program. 
Um, I will also be emailing it out uh, along with a recording of this webinar and any other resources that we cover, but that'll give you kind of a good sense of what Michelle just talked about and the stories that Barb and Monica are about to share. Um, so again, be sure if you have any questions for Michelle to pop them in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And now we will turn it over to Barb Kalbach from Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement to share her story. Barb, take it away. Hi, my name is Barb Kaba, and I'm a fourth generation family farmer from here in Iowa, in the, in the middle of the state. And when I was growing up, there were a lot of family farmers around, and mostly we raised a variety of things. We raised chickens, we had eggs, we had three or four cows to milk, so we had our own milk and our own cream. We had hogs, we had baby pigs, we had um, cattle beef cattle and calves, and some we raised and fed out. But with all those things, we had nearby markets in small towns. We could take the cream and eggs to, or we could take our beef to the auction barn or, or call for bids when our hogs were ready to go to market. So there was a, a large variety of places that we could take our animals. But as time went on, those, um, those sources of to process our, our products kind of dwindled away. And in the 1980s, the farm crisis happened. And during that time, thousands and thousands of farmers were driven off the land. And even still in the 1980s, we still were able to raise hogs, beef, and have a variety of, of cattle on our land um, and our crops also. But, um, with the 1980s and thousands of farmers being driven off the land, the Attorney General made sure that the Packers and Stockyards Act was still in effect so that great big uh, corporations like Smithfield, Tyson, JBS, uh, Prestige could not monopolize livestock farming. And that worked until 1995 when the Iowa legislature passed House File 519, which allowed the building of concentrated animal feeding operations, or what we call today factory farms. And as Michelle kind of explained, what happen, happens is, is great big buildings are built to put those hogs or poultry into, and um, the farmer owns the building and he, and he provides the land and he provides the labor, but the business, owns the hogs and and the feed so when they go to market the farmers paid so much for each head for having done that labor but still smithfield or jbs owns that this, this caused a lot of problems for iowa farmers and farmers across the nation um, what it did was it took away something that we could raise to make money our markets are gone when we had when my husband and i had pigs and we raised pigs and they were ready to go to market, we could call within a 20 mile radius, we could call like four buyers and say we have so many hogs, maybe 50 head of hogs for sale. And they would give us a bid and then we could pick the bid that we wanted, take our hogs there and they would then go ahead and take them to the packing plants on their own. But that was all gone. And so pretty soon we had nowhere to market our hogs because the packing plants were full of factory farm hogs every day. And they'd say to you, if you would call them, they'd say, well, yeah, we can take your 50 head, but we'll have to pay you less money. And um, you'll have to truck them down here, of course, but we'll be able to, to work them in. Well, after a while, it, it costs the farmer to market the, the hogs. And so you just didn't raise them anymore. And that's the way it is now. Today, we still have the auction barns for cattle but there are a lot fewer, and so it's done a lot less. Uh, today, with the COVID um, outbreak, this nice system that was built up by, the, by big corporations um, that always works so efficiently has been found to be very, very flawed. And in this case, in Iowa, we have Smithfield Foods and Tyson Foods that, um, process around 100,000 hogs per week. 
as an example. So when uh, Smithfield had to shut down for three weeks, that meant that, the, that there were 100,000 hogs out there in the Iowa countryside every week ready to go and nowhere to go. There were so many, there was nowhere. The other packing plants were full of their own hogs. They couldn't take anybody. And there were no little and small and moderate size meat packing plants left. And so here are, the, are these producers with these hogs. And you may have read that they have been euthanizing, have been forced to euthanize the 100,000 head a week until the packing plants open up again. Um, now, this could have happened in other ways. This time, it was a COVID virus that impacted human beings and made them sick. But the next time, it could be another virus that impacts the hogs and kills them or the poultry, and then you don't have them going to market. But either way, the, the consumer is left holding the bag because there are there is not a product left for them to buy. These big corporations uh, like Smithfield and JBS especially stand out to me because Smithfield, they are foreign owned. Smithfield and JBS are foreign owned, one by Brazil, one by China. So that's 50% of our hog production that's, that's foreign owned on top of endangering our own food supply. When it was multiple family farmers growing a variety of livestock, and there was a variety of small meat packing plants that you could take them to, you weren't stuck in one plant having sick people in it and therefore having to shut down a huge percentage of the meat that's produced to feed our nation. So what's happened in this period of time that, that this processing, this type of processing food has developed is that it's endangered the food supply of the richest nation on the earth. The other thing that I wanna talk about a little bit with this, with this very same process and this very same type of food production is um, when family farmers were on the land, on the square mile that we live on, there used to be six families and they had kids and they all had this variety of production that I just talked about, the cattle and a few cows to milk and the chickens and the, and the pigs. So they would go to town and they would buy their uh, equipment there, their livestock equipment in town for the pigs. They'd use the veterinarian services. If anybody got sick, they bought their um, equipment in town. They got their repairs done in town. So all of this money was flowing through your communities and the small towns thrived. And a second generation was able to stay on the land if he wanted to. And the, and he learned animal husbandry as he grew up as a child and helped with the land and helped with the livestock. He would learn that and, and had that innate knowledge of how to grow livestock and how to grow crops, how to control erosion, how to um, put nutrients on the land at the right amounts, how just so many small things that you can't just walk out and do without that. Um, experience. So all of those things are happening then. Money was moving in small communities. Well, since we've gone to factory farm, the factory farm system, on our square mile that used to have six families, there is now one family, and that's me and Jim, and no kids. There's no kids in our community, uh, no small livestock operations. So you can imagine the, just the financial impact and that's why Cory Booker, Senator Booker, saw this when he went through Iowa, and Ro Khanna has also seen this, Representative Khanna, that our small towns are dying and the countryside has emptied out. And the question at the end of all this, when you consider all of these things, the question that comes to mind for me is, do we really want all the citizens of the United States to live in a few big cities and empty out the farmland and do we want four or five large corporations dictating who is going to eat and who isn't? Because we're almost there. Thank you, Barb. Um, I think you, I think, thank you for sharing all that. I think you have such a, a powerful story, especially as it relates to the relevancy of right now and the Farm System Reform Act. 
Um, and thank you to you and Iowa Citizens uh, for com Community Improvement for leading this work really in Iowa. Again, that, that personal connection of losing the market to sell as a family farmer to me is such a clear connection again of the importance of the Farm System Reform Act and the work that we're doing at the state level. I think you left out a little, a little bit of how much incredible work that you do at the state level to work on the moratorium, which we will talk about in the question and answers um, because you do such incredible work uh, in your home state. But um, again, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that. If you have any questions for Barb, just pop them in the Q&A. Um, we're gonna get to them in, in just a bit. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Monica Brooks from Concerned Citizens Against Industrial CAFOs in Maryland. And Monica, you're actually muted. So let's unmute you first. <laughs> it happens, there you go. You're all set, go ahead. I'm on. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Monica Brooks with Concerned Citizens Against Industrial CAFOs on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And I'm um, thankful to be here um, with each and every one of you this evening. And um, I just wanna give you um, the perspective of um, just kind of in this, in this territory, I consider myself kind of like a lay person, but I am so honored to have followed um, Barb because um, her story is so awesome because um, the narrative that the industry always says is you're anti-farmer if you say anything against CAFOs. And so here we have, she's one of many farmers um, that are, again, not supportive of the system. So um, for me, um, my fight began when I found out we were going to have um, a 13 no land CAFO being placed on top of our water source um, in the town where I live in, just about um, six tenths of a mile from my house. Um, it seems absolutely insane to think that it would be, someone would think it was okay to put um, 13 CAFOs on top of our only water when we have well water. But alas, um, our county council um, people and our industry people thought it was fine. Um, once I found this out, I um, ended up connecting with people, did an online petition, and I started as one. And so my focus right now, I just want to talk about the importance of a voice. Um, because sometimes you might feel that you're speaking um, to the darkness. You might feel that um, I'm the only one, but you're not. I was putting up the online petitions, I started passing out flyers, and next thing I know, I found other people who were thinking the same thing and we came together um, as a grassroots organization to start fighting against this very thing. And um, we found out early that um, just because it was a concern for the citizens, it was not necessarily concern for our elected officials. Um, we um, painstakingly um, started on our local level and just bombarded our people nonstop our council meetings, doing town halls, and everything that we can do in order to bring and shed light on the system that was put, that's polluting our air and our water. We already have high levels of nitrates. We have our coastal bay um, here that is just inundated. And so um, we got a lot of opposition. Um, some of our members were attacked. Some of them lost their jobs. Um, we had defamation, anything you can imagine, but guess what? We did not give up. And so Concerned Citizens' um, focus is in um, showing that the citizens matter. Your voice matters. The things that bother you matter. Um, here in Salisbury, I've had to deal with my own daughter being diagnosed with asthma and we don't even have a history of asthma in our family. Now, my granddaughter has been diagnosed with asthma. It's a real problem that we have here. So after trying to do everything that we could on local levels, yes, we were thankfully successful in stopping that large project, but there are still other ones that have been popping up and our, our government has been very supportive of it. But um, now from there, 
we understood that we needed to go beyond that and we needed to go to legislation. And so thankfully we were able to connect with Food and Water Watch and other organizations to help us do that. As lay people, we didn't know what to do, but we were able to um, start with a legislative um, focus and with Von Stewart and we're so happy about Senator Booker and this um, Reform Act because where others have said, you know what, why don't you just, um, just let them be, just, just put them further away, just let them not be, but they're not. They are a polluter, they are a destroyer of communities and family systems, they are destroying the independent farmer. When I was a kid, I mean, whether, even though I grew up in a city, when I was a kid, I had the benefit of going to my grandparents' farm in the summer. They had horses, they had cows, they had pigs, different things, they had crops. Um, you can run around and play, you can breathe the air comfortably. I never had my eyes burning, I never had my throat burning. Um, take a moment, 10, not even 10 minutes, five minutes outside of a CAFO and see how you feel. Um, when they tell you that you're making this thing up, that that's not true, um, none of this stuff is happening, it's all lies. And so our endeavor has been to try to take the narrative away that the industry is trying to spin. They're trying to say that we're crazy, that we're trying to destroy farmers, but in fact, they are killing our farmers. They are pigeonholing our farmers into a system that I call indentured servitude. Here, we're bringing you into the system where we're putting a large amount of money that you're gonna have to owe, but yet you owe, you own nothing. And at the drop of a hat, we can cut your contract and just walk away. So I find it very interesting that now we're dealing with COVID and we have lines down. I mean, I have a lady from my church who said she waited for an hour um, just to get some meat, an hour in a line just to get some meat. And that was just two weeks ago. And we have these CAFOs that are supposed to be our saving grace. But the problem is, it's not just the size of them, but because the industry controls everything and takes the power from our farmers who know best. They've been doing this for hundreds of years, thousands of years, long before industry came along. But now you're telling them you don't know what to do. So the distribution is not there. The systems, as Barb talked about, that were in place before are no longer there. And so now you have all of this excess and nowhere to put it. And so I am very <laughs> supportive of a ban on factory farms. I've always said this needs to be regulated as industry because it is industry. And we need to stop, we need to hold our elected officials accountable because they're the ones who we put in office and they work for us. And their voices, our voices should be heard by them, respected by them, not just people with money. I have gone to our legislators, I've gone and run my mouth so much in our Capitol buildings and as much as they wanna say whatever they don't wanna say and you know, oh, well they bring all this money to, um, to everything. I said, well, gee, how great will it be? I said this to our governor, how great would it be that you have all these chickens and no people because everybody's dead or everybody's sick in the hospital? Or are we just gonna be chicken city? And I said, and guess what? They're not our top four, they're our fourth or fifth largest employer. So at the end of the day, we need to stop putting money before people. We need to be concerned about individuals and their health their well-being, and just because I'm one voice at this moment, I'm actually not alone. And so we will continue to con con um, connect with others and just very thankful for all the different coalitions. And I wanna encourage you, if you have something going on in your community, don't be afraid to speak out. You might feel like you're alone, but you know what? You have to do what's best for your family. You have to do what's best for your community. And I tell people all the time, I'm not fighting just for myself and my community and my family, but I'm fighting for all communities because all of us deserve the right to good water, clean water,
clean air, you know, and and to be able to go and support my independent farm, um, you know, for product, you know, and I believe in putting my money where my mouth is. You're not going to find me buying no capo chicken, okay? That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, as I've said, I really want to encourage you to stand up for your communities and stand up um, and, and, and take a break. I mean, for some people, they, they have been forced to do meatless Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays <laughs> and Thursdays. Um, you can make a difference, even if you're just one, because you're not really just one. You're not the only one. Okay. Thank you, Monica. I think, I think a lot of what you said in there, um, especially highlighting how, you know, you, you built this from scratch. There's, there's, you know, the one voice that came together with the petition. It's like a, a natural born organizer, a story of like, truly, truly taking matters into your own hands and going throughout the different, doing what you're supposed to do, you know, going to your, your, your small community electeds, then to your state electeds, and now saying, you know, enough is enough. We need a federal fix on this. We're still going to fight at home, but, you know, we need, we need to stop this problem. I think it's a very powerful testament to the momentum of this movement and the political space that you've really helped to create in introducing the Farm System Reform Act, along with obviously a lot of groups across the country, but um, really truly the, the work that has been done in on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And you also speak to a lot of the, the issues specifically in Maryland with air quality um, that most people don't hear about with water quality in the Midwest around a lot of different types of CAFOs. So thank you for bringing all of that and, and really showing that this food system has been broken both by corporate power and rogue politics. I know you've been up against a lot of aggressive opposition in your community too. So I'm thankful for you fighting for that as well, through that as well. Um, before we get into q and A, I I do want to mention um, that, again, we're going to email, in the email that I'm going to give to you tomorrow morning, there will be a petition for you to ask your senators and representatives to support this bill. So we're going to drop that in the chat in just a moment. Um, right now, Senator Elizabeth Warren has joined Senator Cory Booker in sponsoring this bill, which is really exciting. And Representative Ro Khanna introduced, again, this bill just today. He had original co-sponsors, uh, Representative Raskin from Maryland, Representative Liu from California, Representative Norton of DC, Representative DeFazio and Blumenauer from Oregon, and Representative Holland of New Mexico. So really exciting, strong introduction. Um, and we're gonna keep organizing to get more of our representatives on there. But when you see that link to, to do that petition, make sure that you do sign it and um, you know call, call your representative as well. Um, we've had so many people submit question and answer. I know there's a lot going on in the chat as well. We're going to start working through some of those before we get to about five of when we're going to play that special clip for you from Senator Cory Booker to all of you tonight. So I'm going to loop back to Michelle and I'm going to ask, we've gotten a lot of questions and I think we've talked about this a lot. Um, can you speak to Food and Water Watch's work in light of the coronavirus and maybe also um, kind of close up and talk about the movement that has been built to create this moment? A little bit of a two-parter, but I've gotten both of those, so I want to give them to you, to, to you both right now. Okay, so the, I might come back to you for the second part. So the first part is what have we done during coronavirus? Um, so we've done a lot. Um, we early on continue a theme of there's enough food, it's a food distribution issue. We demanded that governors deploy the National Guard to assist with food distribution distribution and the supplement supply chains. So as folks have mentioned, even though the industry wants you to believe that we're running out of food, um, milk is being dumped, crops are being plowed under, animals are being euthanized. In addition, the biggest corporate meat producers have amassed large reserve stockpiles in cold storage due to factors like overproduction and the lingering effects of um, President Trump's trade war with China. And furthermore, a lot of our production is used for exports. So 30% of American pork, 14% of beef is exported, which all could be rerouted to shore up domestic supply. So it's not, again, about supply, but about distribution. And those food supply chain disruptions are caused by what we've been talking about, this deepening corporate control of our ag system. Um, we've also been really active in the um, conversation around stimulus funding. 
advocating that the Small Business Administration loans be given to small and medium-sized farmers who are not originally eligible. We're fighting to block corporate agricultural giants from rating relief to, to, to buy out their competitors by using a $600 billion slush fund that the Federal Reserve gets to hand out. Um, relatedly, we're calling for an immediate moratorium on corporate agriculture mergers because FTC and the United States Department of Justice resumed a policy to cut certain merger reviews um, in response to COVID-19. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to also mention that before COVID-19, we were calling for the same thing by building support for another one of Senator Booker and um, Representative Ro Khanna's bills, the Food and Agribusiness Merger Moratorium and Antitrust Review Act of 2019, um, which would initiate a moratorium on really large mergers while allowing for time to assess the impacts that it's had on farmers and workers and consumers, and also um, requiring a review of our antitrust laws to make you know, recommendations about reforms to make them stronger. And that, those, that bill was introduced in the House and Senate in 2018. And then finally, we've been doing a lot of work around food safety and worker safety, rather. Um, as you probably know, labor conditions and meatpacking plants have driven really major coronavirus outbreaks among workers. We've had 21 plants closed, more than 10,000 workers sickened, and at least 45 workers have died. And yet these companies recently successfully lobbied Trump to issue an executive order that now compels plants to reopen and stay open, citing again, misleading industry claims of supply shortages as a justification. So through the appropriations process, we're trying to advocate for federal safety guidelines to become mandatory um, because plants shouldn't be open if workers aren't protected. Um, we're fighting also against waivers for line speeds that have been given. We're fighting against privatized inspection, which threatens workers while increasing the risk of adulterated meat getting into our food supply. So we're doing a lot with a lot of, I mean, there's lots of groups in these spaces doing great work that we're trying to coordinate with and leverage our resources. But those are the three things. There's a lot to do. Um, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that and giving us kind of an arc of all the things that can be done and, and need to be done. Obviously, there's a lot more as well, but um, this this is part of a, a big a big project. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Barb next, and I think we've gotten different iterations of this question. But there's there's a big question around how are we gonna replace factory farming, and and also kind of a question around are Americans willing to do that hard work as farmers? Um, I know in your experience, obviously as a farmer, you can speak to that, but how are we gonna do this? And what are you seeing that we can make farming again? Well, I think, um, I think yes, there are people who would want to farm um, and, and put the hard work into farming because it is so rewarding uh, when you can, can grow a crop and harvest it and market it and the same way if, if you especially like to raise livestock it's there um, so there are people that that would like to do that work it costs a lot of money it costs a lot of money at this point and we do not um, earn nearly the money that it costs just to to continue to plant and to uh, grow and harvest so those things have to change and back in the uh after world war ii they had what they called a parity program where farmers earned the cost of production at least and the the government guaranteed it then there was a set aside that went with that there would be set aside acres so that too many acres wouldn't be planted to the same crop and um that sustained farmers and they were able to sustain their farms and have a steady income on top of it. So yeah, there are a lot of ways to do, to look at the problem. Um, another thing would be something like a new Homestead Act where the federal government could entice people to, or ask people, would you like to move to the country or would you like to move to the countryside? And uh, we will, um, you could have this piece of land or this particular home because there are a lot of, uh, homes that are empty now in small towns. So that would give people a chance to move out of the city um, and back into the small towns, start small businesses again. There's a lot of things that could be done. Ro Khanna liked the idea. He did say, but you would need broadband. And that's true. We do need broadband in the country. Okay. But there are a lot of things that we could do to go to smaller businesses, smaller farms. And, and the smaller farms then create a demand 
for the small businesses to market your crops and your produce through. Um, already farmers markets are, are very, very popular in the Midwest and well, most cities, I think they are. Urban gardens have been started, chickens have been started in the urban areas. So people are really looking at the small production again and how they can manage that and use that for their, their own nutrition and the community's nutrition. Yeah. And I remember when we were talking about this too, you were saying then, then we wouldn't see the kids leaving and that really struck me. Um, you know, the rural decline that the, this corporate takeover has really um, done to our farming systems. So, yeah. Well, you know, and that's an important aspect of it too, because as I said earlier, there is so much that as a child growing up on the farm that you learn. And okay. so by the time you're grown, you have that, what I call an innate knowledge of how to make that land work and how to make that, that animal grow and how to nurture um, how to work with mother nature and not just plow her over or um or use technology to overcome her um or put so much manure on her that she doesn't know what to do uh, <laughs> and that has been a big issue which got me started uh, with iowa citizens for community improvement is our uh, water in iowa uh, impaired waterways have grown from 200 to over well over 700 here in the state and it comes as a direct result of what we do to mother nature and to the land so those are all things that can be corrected and we keep working we keep working right. to correct that great great well thank you i am going to move this now to monica and a little bit of a shift um I, we were talking about this before and we've gotten a lot of questions about what can i do now uh what can i do in my community to support this bill and how do I get my message out to a larger audience? Can you speak to um, some of the things that you've done to organize in your community or ways that you would support this bill? Let's make sure. I'm gonna make sure you're unmuted. <laughs> there you go. So, um, as I mentioned before, the one of the first things on the low level starting that petition was um, a door opener for us um, and getting the word out to people because initially for us, it was education. Um, educating the people as to what it was, why it was an issue, why it was a problem, and then to get them engaged. Um, so if you, once you get the people educated and engaged, um, we did door to doors, literally, we made flyers, we made posters, we created a huge banner, a huge sign, um, and we went to every single local legislative group meeting that there was, every single one. And we spoke at every single one. And when they said, oh, you have the same people talking? Well, each time we would bring five or 10 different people for each single one. And as we did that, we started to do letters to the editor. We did, um, wrote out to um, different organizations that in turn reached out to us, Food and Water Watch, um, SRAP, Center for Livable Future. Um, and then we got press. We ended up getting press from protesting. Um, it's, it seems primitive, but it's very effective. And as a result of that, um, constantly bombarding them, um, we put pressure on our local people. We got some changes done, um, not enough, um, but that just encouraged us to push forward and go to the state level. And so we've been working hard at the state level, um, going um, and constantly going to our Senate hearings, um, house um, hearings, trying to get things changed here. And you may seem, you may think, well, how do I do that? I don't know these kinds of things. Let me tell you, <laughs> you find out really quickly, you have a right to go and call your senators, your, your um, congressmen and ask them and call them up and say, I need to talk to you. This is my concern. This is what's going on. And this is what I need to know. So those are some of the things um, that you can do. And once you connect, once you start kind of going forward and, and really putting the pressure, then you'll get some response. For us, it was not from our local officials. Our responses came from other parts of Maryland, which in turn is absolutely ridiculous, but we know why, because the money is going to these local officials. So we got people like Von Stewart and Senator Lamb, different ones to, um, 
come alongside and help us do some legislation. And now with um, Cory Booker's um, Reform Act, he has in turn encouraged um, Senator Vaughn, I mean, uh, Delegate Vaughn to do even more, to make it even more robust um, system. So I feel like it's sparking, it's creating a spark that slowly smolders and then eventually it grows into a nice bonfire. And so it's, you, you have to start somewhere, but it can be done if you're persistent, if you're passionate and you are not afraid. You know what, you, you might feel a little bit afraid here and there, but don't let these people scare you because they're just people. And what you need <laughs> is more important right. than whatever baloney that they have to say. And at the end of the day, vote them out. <laughs> there you go. I've, I've seen Monica in action and um, it's, it's so true. They're even from that little petition all the way up to the top. Um, it's, it's, uh, you, we have the petition here with the Farm System Reform Act. You can do local organizing in your district around um, your representative's district. So now that we have the Senate and the, and the House version, so that's really exciting. Um, and you, call, you can call them up, you can, you can get meetings, uh, town halls, all the things that Monica said. There's so much to do. Um, so yes, thank you for sharing all of that, especially with the context of, of Maryland's House and Senate as well. If I could say one, one uh, quick other thing, Rebecca, um, there are different apps and different um, ways you can look up and see the voting of your legislators to see the things that they support and the things that they don't support. And the things that you want them to support, you can push for that. You can put up signs and say, oh, this person doesn't care about your air. They don't care if you drink bad water because they voted against X, Y, and Z. So there are different things that you learn along the way um, to get the job done. That's right. Um, great. Well, I'm going to move, I'm going to move us. I have one question that I want to pose. I think what I'm going to do with a couple minutes here, um, let's do, we have this one question that's been asked a lot and I think we come across in the movement a lot. So I'm going to pose it both, um, Barb, Monica, and then, uh, Michelle, if you each want to say maybe 30, 45 seconds on this. Um, or is any other kind of closing thoughts, takeaways that you want to share with everyone before we do the video? So again, kind of like 30 seconds, 45 seconds. But one of the really big questions we keep getting asked is, it seems like passing these bills and banning factory farms will be really hard. We come across this all the time. It seems politically impossible. Why not fight for something that is more politically possible? possible, like better regulations or enforcement. Um, so I'm going to start with Michelle, answer a, some of that. And if there's any closing thought um, before we head over to the video, and we'll go through each of you to answer that question. So anything's politically possible with people <laughs> power, right? And, and, and as we said, as with the Farm System Reform Act, while we're transitioning out of the food model, of course, we need to hold the existing facilities and um, accountable, right, for their pollution and harms. I'm gonna go rogue for a second, Rebecca, <laughs> just because I saw this conversation in the chat about we should just buy from local farmers and we should just stop eating meat and that's gonna solve our factory farm problem. And I just wanted to mention that we can't, that would not be enough. So the only choices consumers have are the ones industry and government give you. So you can exercise your best choices at your supermarket, for example, but, if your options are bad, you're not moving the needle. So there's not a lot of choice at the grocery store. All those brands you see are mostly all owned by a handful of companies. We're not supporting a lot of farmers. Not everyone can afford to buy local or buy organic. Not everyone has access to farmers. Two thirds of our farmers in our country don't have access to direct markets. And then finally, everyone could go vegan in the country and we're still gonna have factory farms because so much of our food is produced for export. And so it's really important that we focus on policy change. Yes, we need to eat less meat. Yes, we need to exercise our market power where we can. We're not gonna make progress without policy change. So we need to break up these food monopolies so farmers, small and medium can compete and consumers can have affordable healthy choices. That's right, I'm glad you went rogue. Um, Sorry, <laughs> there's a lot of good. conversation it's in the chat. I just went That's right. Um, Barb, Monica, why, why it seems like passing these bills are impossible. Why ban factory farms? Let's go to Barb. You have to, you have to buy or ban factory farms. It, it's a proven, 
the COVID virus has proven that it is a system that cannot feed the American people. That's for starters, or we wouldn't have great big long food lines right now. It is not nimble. It can't shift when things change and things happen. So we have to have a different business model to feed the American people. And in order to develop that business model, we have to have a moratorium on the further expansion and building of factory farms so that we can work on what will feed the American people and how we can implement that. So yes, we can have a moratorium is the first place to go. That's where we have that's to start. Right. And that's what you're starting with in Iowa. That's right. Um, thank you for that's that. That's right. And for clean water. Of you know, that, yeah. I that's, mean, you know, just a little the, the side note there. Issue. That's a huge <laughs> issue that you all are really being impacted by in Iowa. That's right. Um, that's right. Before, before we head to that video, I'm trying to keep us in the hour. Um, thank you both for that. Monica, do you want to say uh, why ban factory farms or a closing sentiment to us? Um, just, I mean, I, I concur with Barb and I, you know, at the end of the day, it's a terrible system. I, we have about four major producers within an hour of me. Um, so it's not distribution if they can just mosey it down the street, right? Um, so people here are not even getting access to the, <laughs> the factories here. They opened up, speaking of COVID, they opened up a whole section that has been paid for by our local hospital just to house the factory chicken workers who have gotten COVID. It's so many of them that they've actually put a whole wing for them just to, for these people. So at the end of the day, this system is horrible. It's not good for anyone. Yes, moratorium for now and eventually a ban. We have to stand up for our rights, for the air that's being polluted, for the water that's being contaminated, and for the system that is crunching, you know, that is taking the power away from our farmers to be independent and do what they do best and give us an opportunity to diversify um, we don't even have crops anymore. So at the end of the day, um, a ban is what's necessary. That's right. Well, thank you all for the, the thoughtful discussion and those, those comments. Um, we're going to get ready at this point to play that quick five minute video from Senator Booker. If you'll all hang on with us a couple of minutes after the hour, um, I will have my colleague cue that up and we will play that in just a moment. We have a broken food system in America. We've been seeing a lot of it now in the news, but many of us have been concerned and compelled by this reality for a long time. The food system is broken and we must feel a national sense of urgency to fix it. Farmers who are being forced to plow over their crops, killing healthy animals, while food banks around the country now struggle to meet the demand from Americans is just showing again how COVID-19 is revealing a lot of the fragility and brokenness of systems that we can fix. We got here because for decades we've had policy failures that have allowed our farm systems to get so consolidated that now only a handful of companies control the majority of the food that we eat. These companies have used their power to treat farmers so unfairly, to exploit workers, to develop practices that are cruel to animals, unnecessarily so, and damage the environment all while putting public health at greater risk. Now, those same corporations who have profited off of this broken system are coming asking the government for help to fix the mess that they were such a part of creating. I strongly disagree with President Trump's executive order to put profits of these corporations ahead of the health and safety and economic well being of workers by keeping many of these meat packing facilities open. There is a better way for us to go forward. While the industrialized food system is failing us, many independent family farms, farmers markets, food hubs that make up what we call local food systems are thriving. I've heard the stories from all across the country that local farmers 
who are there to innovate and make sure folks have food are showing us the way forward. As we look to the future, to not only endure this crisis, to not only overcome the challenges, but to create a healthier, more vibrant future, let us understand that it is local food systems that we need to invest heavily in. It's not only an issue that's moral, it's not only an issue for the well-being of our farmers and all of Americans, it's actually a national security issue. Last year, I introduced the Farm System Reform Act to phase out large factory farms and transition, transition to a system that is better for farmers, better for rural communities, better for the environment, and stops so much of this needless animal cruelty that's exhibited in the larger factory farming world. I'm excited that Representative Ro Khanna is introducing this bill in the House and that my former colleague Elizabeth Warren has joined me as a Senate co-sponsor. We are building momentum in a national movement. After this crisis, we need to make sure that America's food systems are stronger and more resilient and more elevating of the well-being of all Americans. This means not simply going back to business as usual, but instead using our moral imagination and our moral urgency to create a brighter future by passing the Farm System Reform Act and phasing out these multinational big corporate factory farms. And instead of putting our faith and support behind them, let's actually put our faith in us, in farmers, and those family farms that can show us the way to conservation, to economic empowerment, to national security, to a robust local food systems in which we all win, in which America wins. That was our heritage, and that is the promise for a brighter future. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, whew, that was a really powerful ending. Um, I wanna give a special thank you to Barb with Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement and Monica from Concerned Citizens Against Industrial CAFOs in Maryland. Thank you to Michelle and the rest of my team at Food and Water Watch for making tonight possible. And thank you to Senator Cory Booker, Representative Ro Khanna, and all of the con Congress members who joined them in introducing the Farm System Reform Act. I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight and I wanna urge you to join us in this movement. Call and meet with your senators and representatives. Make sure you send them a message. Again, I'm going to email you tomorrow morning with more information to show you how. We're right there every step of the way. It is more important than ever to ban factory farms. Like everyone showed you tonight, our food system depends on it. We depend on it. We have the roadmap in the Farm System Reform Act and we have the team with these movement leaders and all of you to do it. So thank you for joining us tonight. Stay well, and we will see you next time.